everyone. Happy Homebrew Wednesday. How the hell are you? Drinking up on my New England Pale Ale um, wannabe. I definitely failed at that, but uh, let's get to that in a minute. In the meanwhile, cheers. Mm. It's definitely the one with the Conan yeast strain. Vermont Ale, right from the East Bay. Um, it's got that peach estuary notes. It's got sort of other stone fruit uh, notes as well. It's got a nice uh, lingering bitterness to it. So it's definitely uh, more towards the IPA category than it is uh, pale ale. And as you can see, it's uh, pretty clear uh, without the uh, condensation. But um, yeah, I failed on the clarity. And uh, um, why? Well, Probably because of my water. Um, I just didn't treat the water uh, the way that the guys in New England treat their water. Um, I treated my water similar to how I normally would. On this one I did use uh, chloride um, to sulfate on about a 2 or a 3 to 1 scale. More for chloride, right? So, um, yeah. It, it's got a really nice taste to it. It's got a really nice mouthfeel, but uh, as you can see, it's clear as a bell, and it's only been in the keg for a couple weeks. So, uh, yeah. Here's the other one. This one was fermented with uh, Vermont Ale yeast. This one was fermented with um, Y yeast, uh, London Ale 3. And as you can see, they're both pretty well clear. And uh, I failed. <laughs> But uh, for the taste, the taste on this one, it is different. It's uh, not as stone fruity as this one, obviously. So I can definitely, the clarity on the beer is about the same. The color is about the same. So you know how yeast affects color. But in this case, not so much. But the flavors are different. And... Uh, the stone fruit one is a little bit more sharp, uh, whereas the London Ale yeast is a little bit more laid back and smooth. And, uh, the hops on this one are a little bit more piney and resiny, whereas this one is all about the stone fruit and uh, a really nice coating and bitterness. So there you have it. That's the summary of the, uh, the wannabe New England Pale Ale, but uh, they're more like sessionable IPAs. Uh, these days, again, they've only been in the keg for, uh, I think, two and a half uh, weeks. So, there you go. Not much about now what's going on in the um, home brew front here on the homestead. We had that uh, work party that I had brewed up a bunch of beer for. And that was fantastic. I didn't bring the pale ale. Uh, I didn't think it was ready at the time. Uh, it was right on the cuff between tasting green and uh, tasting like it does now. So I'm kind of happy that I got to keep <laughs> keep it for myself. It's a little selfish, but uh, sometimes, you know, that's okay. I did donate three kegs. You know, there was the coffee stout, there was a English special bitter, and also a Pilsner. I have, uh, I brewed up a double batch of each one of those, so I still have uh, some of those here. Actually, I still have a full keg of the ESB, full keg of the Pilsner, and uh, about five, probably about five liters left of the coffee stout. I only brewed a five-gallon batch on that one, but there was about uh, six liters that was left over from the party. Um, the ESB and the uh, the uh, the Pilsner, the Pilsner went first. Go figure. Um, ESB uh, that went. And then uh, Yomar, my colleague, he also brought a, uh, a very nice uh, taste in pale ale. That went over really well, so cool. Um, I uh, got a special shout out to uh, Sticky Tentacles, uh, Christian. Uh, we met up on Friday and uh, we did a beer swap. So I gave him some beers, he gave me some beers and some mead and some wine. So let me go ahead and show you what I got. 
Let's go ahead and start off with this one. Uh, everyone's uh, seen the reviews that are coming out by uh, um, other brew tubers, and um, this is the bastard. So it's a brown ale, which he had oat cubes that he had uh, um, soaked up in uh, cognac, I believe, and uh, there were some other things that were going on with this beer, so it was a real bastard, and uh, so he named it so. Um, so yeah. Uh, 4.9% brown ale. That should be really nice and sessionable. Looking forward to cracking these open. Let's go next. He also gave me an IPA, calling it the Vienna IPA. Coming in at 7.1%. Yeah, so a nice IPA. And uh, so we go from the brown ale to the IPA. And next, Memory Mismatch. This is his double IPA. Coming in at 7.7%. There we go. Gonna like his label. Sticky tentacles. Cool, huh? Here's the mead that he gave me. And I believe that we use the same type of honey in order to brew this, but his is coming out a little bit lighter than mine has. But I think mine has sort of been aging longer. Um, haven't done anything to mine. It's still in the secondary uh, conditioning. And uh, I've been wanting to kind of experiment with some teas on that uh, lately. I think that's what I'm gonna do kind of break it up into about three one gallon batches and do two different types of teas in one and then one keep one for the base but uh, yeah so this is his first mead um, 13 percent uh, funny how that just goes so high um, and here we go we've got his uh, boneyard grandma it's a uh, cider coming in at 10.5 percent um, cool I'm gonna go ahead and crash that and uh, Give that one a whirl. And finally, the wine. This is the uh, the wine kit that he used. Um, I believe for these uh, specific grapes. And uh, so, my wife was happy to that I brought this home and that uh, I'll get to share this with her on a uh, nice evening in the near future. Uh, so there you go. Big thanks to Christian for uh, giving me these beers. To do a beer swap. When it comes to the reviews, I know that's not people's favorite thing is to watch reviews of other people's beers, especially if you can't get those beers locally or you know, through the usual BrewTuber channels. Um, but I think it's important in order to be able to share the experience with others, uh, home brewers specifically, uh, and BrewTubers about how others' beers uh, taste and just share the experience. So um, I will be doing a review with these beers so you'll see those coming out on the channel and I hope that's okay with you. Also that night when we met up to exchange the beers, there was also Andrew that was with us. Andrew's a guy that I met through uh, the local homebrew store. He works at Brigeland in Strommen and sometimes in Drommen. So if you're in one of those stores and uh, you happen to meet this uh, tall gentleman with a Scottish accent, that's Andrew. Um, say hi to him and uh, um, yeah he's a really nice guy ask him anything because he's a really nice guy and he's got a lot of knowledge and insight and he'll pretty much be able to answer any question that you want I uh, really appreciate it thanks a lot meeting up with you guys cheers beyond that there's not been much going on guys uh, the keys are still full so I've only got one free keg and um, yeah, there's not a lot of things going on here, so I, uh, yeah, I'm not drinking during the week, so I've got a lot of beer to get through, and so I'm just sort of relaxing on the home brewing front. But it doesn't mean that I'm relaxing overall. Um, for those of you that know me, whenever I get my head into something, I sort of disappear into it for a while, and that's where I've been lately, actually. Uh, instead of doing homebrew Wednesdays or anything on YouTube, pretty much been work, family and water i'm doing a lot of uh, research into water of course i read the water book through and through probably two or three times um i've done a lot of reading by greg noonan um aj delang and i want to put together a series of videos for home brewers um for and, and put everything basically in layman's terms i don't want you to have to know all of the nitty-gritty details here and I sort of want to talk about those things and highlight those things 
So uh, let me know if that sort of interests you, if it sort of uh, strikes a chord with you, and uh, I'll uh, post those videos shortly. So just as a little teaser for this water issue, I got a question for you. I did an experiment where I took tap water, put it into a bowl, add in gypsum, and also Epsom salt to it, which is basically calcium sulfate and magnesium sulfate. So with the addition of calcium and magnesium into the water, tap water, what do you think happened? Do you think that that raised the pH or lowered the pH? So let's go ahead and take a look at this experiment because I think it's a little bit um, enlightening and gives you a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to be talking about with this uh, water series of videos. Here you go. Okay, so in this experiment, I have a one liter of water at 20 degrees Celsius. I've calibrated my pH meter. Right now it's reading at 20 degrees at uh, 7.01. Um, I've got magnesium, calcium sulfate, and calcium chloride. The experiment here is to see if magnesium, calcium uh, can decrease the pH in a water solution alone without malts. So, the uh, taking the pH meter, you can see as I move it around here, it, it's pretty sensitive. Now it's 70, 6.99, 70, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead, take this out of the uh, buffer solution, and I'm just going to go ahead and take off as much of the solution around the sensor I can. Just to, just have to touch it really to get off any of the water. So I'm going to go ahead and just stick it in the water and let it tell me what the pH of the water is alone. So in addition to that, I also have a stainless steel container, completely empty and dry. I have my um, high resolution scale here. And what I want to do is just push this over and I'm going to take out calcium sulfate first. And I want to measure out a gram of that. Take about a gram of calcium sulfate. There we go. It's exactly a gram. Now the pH still reading about six point six nine, six point seven. It's right in there, about, uh, let's call it 6.7. I'm going to go ahead and take this out while I mix it. So here's my gram of calcium. You can see it's empty. I'm just going to stir this up with my uh, thermometer. Add in our pH meter again and check out the value. See what the current value is. Seven point zero four. Okay. And go ahead and take that out. Just to make sure that the pH meter is still calibrated, let's go ahead and clean it off. And then we'll stick it back in the buffer solution and make sure that it's still 7, 6.99 or 7. There we go. At the same time, while we're waiting for that to calibrate, I'm going to take some calcium chloride. I'm going to take a gram of that. Let's tar the measure. Okay. 
So if you see the pH meter, it's right back on 7, 7.0, 7.01. It's right in there. Here I have one gram of calcium chloride. So I'm going to add that to the water. I'm going to go ahead and stir it up. See if I can actually get this to dissolve. <clears throat> So the pH meter is still reading 7.0, 7.03. Let's go ahead and clean this off so it doesn't influence. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue taking a reading. Seven point eight and dropping, seven point seven. All right, let's call it seven point two nine, and uh, it's holding steady there. Now let's go ahead and add in a little bit of magnesium. It's empty. this we're going to add in a gram of magnesium sulfate which is uh, there we go so that's 1.1 gram and get rid of 0.1 that's 0.9 go 1.0 on the scale Let's see 7.33 on the pH meter it went up a little bit okay let's go ahead and add in the magnesium magnesium sulfate this will be the last addition so I'll make sure I just get everything we'll give it a quick stir Let's go ahead and track the pH. Seven point four zero. Alright, looks like it's going to hold steady right at 7.40. If I move it around a little bit, see if that changes anything. 7.41. Yeah, 7.4. Let's call it 7.4. So there you go. If you were one of the ones who answered that the pH would go down, I'm sorry uh, to say that you were wrong. So the pH, uh, when you add calcium or magnesium to plain water doesn't have any reaction except to increase the pH. So um, very sort of uh, tricky things to get into to think about and I look forward to being able to share some of these things with you in the future so go ahead and uh, look forward to those things uh, coming out soon. I hope you guys are having a hell of a week and a better weekend. Cheers.